Yeah, see, other people are playing lots of lag, too. Hello, and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 86, Lonely Fun, gaming-related things to keep you busy between games. From Hamilton, I'm Sean, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the RPG maitre d', answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We start live every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. All right, right now, many of us are missing out on our regular game nights and looking for something gaming-related to keep our minds off of what's going down in the world. So tonight, we've got some gaming-related activities that you can take part in between game sessions or when you don't have a game session. I've also got a review of Exit the Game, the House of Riddles, and a two-player trick-taking card game for our weekend review. We love interacting with our viewers and listeners. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we've received, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. You can also hit us up on social media. I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. And I can be found everywhere as Dark Elf LX. Up first, a comment from Roger Maloche in regards to quick and easy two-player games. For a real, really challenging two-player game that isn't too complicated but very intense, you can try Nirishima Hex. You can try the app before you buy the game, only available for Android. It be plays best with two players. Oh, thanks for the comment, Roger. While I do like Niroshima Hex quite a lot, I'm not sure I would consider it quick and easy. I guess with experienced players, you can finish a game in under an hour, but that hasn't been my experience. I've had games go as long as two. Plus, I don't personally think this one's easy to learn at all, especially when you consider learning to play well and not just putting stuff out on the board to see what happens. Well, Evan Edwards had a comment on the YouTube version of our Ask the Bellhop segment on games that reduce or eliminate contact. Ricochet Robot is a weird quirk of a game mm. with one to infinity players. Only one person has to touch the board if the current player describes their move. Robo Rally, you have to deal every round, not every phase, and collect and shuffle the cards. Well, thanks for your comment, Evan. I have to assume Evan hasn't played the newest version of Robo Rally, only the older ones, because the newest edition put out by Hasbro eliminates the shared deck of programmed cards. So every player has their own deck of cards now, and only that player has to touch them. That's the reason I ended up putting that on that recommendation list. Now, Ricochet Robots is a great suggestion. It's a very neat puzzle game. I personally own an updated version called Mutant Meeples, where basically the robots that you're moving around the map have uh, each has a special power, depending on which meeple it is. I have had quite a bit of fun with that game myself, though I gotta admit, that one is not for everyone. I've had some really game with some people. It all depends on how much you like puzzles and real-time puzzles where you're trying to solve it before other players. Well, Matt B has a couple of licensed games they want to recommend. There was a Buck Rogers Battle for the 25th Century, which was kind of Axis and Allies-ish. Mm. Basically, used the uh, 20... XXDC background as a setup for the game. It was a late TSR era, and they were trying to go head-to-head -head with Hasbro, Hasbro in, in terms of components and fiddly bits. I'll toss in one more from the olden days, Bleeding Edge's Aliens game. Solitaire game, mostly. I remember playing it at cons with one person playing each Marine, but that wasn't the normal way to play. But it does a good job of mounting tension as the Xenomorphs begin to tear through the Marines and they try to escape. Scenarios of pretty much every action scene in the film, including Xenomorph versus Pharaoh, if I recall correctly. But I think most just use the initial encounter scenario or a variant of it. Well, thanks for the recommendations, Matt. Um, I've got the Buck Rogers RPG, the 25th century version from TSR. That's a neat looking game. I haven't had a chance to read through it yet. It's on my shelf of shame. And I got it recently. I picked it up off of a fellow gamer, William Humphrey, the Star Wars guy. Uh, when I had tried an older TSR 
Buck Rogers game, and he's like, have you tried this one out? But I've never seen this board game. It looks pretty cool. I took a look at it on Board Game Geek, and it looks really solid. And yeah, tons of plastic bits. So yeah, it definitely has a look like Axis and Allies. And then I got to say, this Aliens game sounds really neat. I had no idea there was a solo play Aliens game. I've never had no clue that even existed. Again, I took a quick look at the Board Game Geek entry, and I don't recognize it at all. Now, what I did find confusing on Board Game Geek, there was, I can't tell if the game's supposed to have miniatures or not, because it looks like a lot of people have made 3D maps and minis for this game, whereas I think it's more of a traditional board game with pawns, but I actually couldn't tell what was artistic and what was the actual game. But we will toss both of these games in our show notes. Well, long-term fan of the show, Emmett O'Brien, had a comment about one of our AMA topics from last week, where we were talking about the definition of a game. Jesse Shell defines a game, a game is a problem-solving activity approached with a playful attitude. Very broad to be sure, but it's hard to falsify, although a lot of people want game to mean something more specific, but in everyday use it works. Well, thanks for the comment, Emmett. Uh, it definitely does add to the conversation. I'm not sold on this definition, though, because I'm not sure that all games involve problem solving. Plus, if they do involve problem solving, then we get back to what we talked about in the AMA, where a game had to have a winner and loser. Well, if you solve the problem, you win, and if you fail to solve the problem, you lose. Or in most modern, like, Euro game style games, whoever solves the problem better is going to be the person that wins. I don't know. What do you think about this one? Well, I have to agree with you here. Uh, while I respect the work Jesse does as an uh, educator in, in gaming, uh, I can't say I support his definition here, specifically relating to the problem-solving aspect, without encompassing just an overly broad definition of yeah. what problem-solving is. Um, yeah. So, Chris Groff has a comment about last week's Courier's review. Love the concept, even love the general play, mm -hmm. but the random on top of random, and the fact that usually, by the time you got to the best beasts, the game was mm -hmm. over. Yeah, thanks for the comment, Chris. Uh, that was something I didn't really touch on in the review. I did touch on the randomness, but because the game is an engine builder, another aspect of it is that by the time you're at the point you can start affording the best monsters, the best dice in the game, the game tends to end. You're at the end of that engine building period, and you never get to really use them. Now, you combine that with the fact that if you do actually get to draw those cool monsters, there's a good chance you're going to roll the wrong side on them and still not get to use them, which is definitely a downfall for couriers. Well, finally, we got a comment from Emil, um, Emil Larson, the mm -hmm. designer behind the sci-fi 4X game Burning Sun. He left a comment on the unboxing video of Burning Sun we released on Monday. Thanks a lot for looking at my game, Mo. Nice video. Oh, and by the yeah. way, the box is a Kickstarter thing. Since it was only produced in 1,500 copies, only a handful of copies could be sold after Kickstarter boxers got theirs. So therefore, the special artwork-only box. Hopefully, I can do some more Burning Sun stuff mm. in the future where a proper box will be utilized. Looking forward to hearing what you think of the game itself. All right, that's awesome just to see the fact. I, I love it. I love any time a designer, publisher, artist, anyone else involved in the making of a game actually checks out our content and takes time to interact. So right off the bat, thank you for that, Emil. That's awesome to see. So a bit of background. So one of the first things I mentioned and complained about, honestly, when unboxing Burning Suns was the fact the box tells you absolutely nothing but the name of the game and the fact you can tell it's sci-fi because it's got spaceships and suns and stuff on it. It, to be honest, was one of the most useless game boxes I've ever seen because it told you nothing, absolutely zero, about the game. I noted that if I picked this up at a game store, I would have no idea what I was looking at and there was zero chance I would buy it. I just think it was a terrible decision. Now that Emil points out this was a Kickstarter exclusive box, I guess that makes a lot more sense. Now, I have to say it still seems odd. Like, to me, I'd still think I'd want that info, but I guess there's no need to tell me what I get in the box when I'm only people who back the Kickstarter are going to get it. So if you back the Kickstarter, you I hopefully know what you're getting already before you backed. And I fully was aware of what was in the box before opening it. So fair enough. I guess that's fair. Though, you know what? If I ever wanted to resell this, or if I wanted to put it for consignment, I would have a hard time passing this on. Or even if I put it in an extra life auction, I'd have to like open it up because no one's going to know what I'm trying to offer to them. Now, I'm not trying to get rid of this game. I haven't even played it yet. But just to me, that's a consideration that probably publishers want to take into consideration, that maybe the person who bought it off the Kickstarter isn't going to be the end person who has the game. Yep. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Thank you to everyone who shares, comments, and interacts with our content. 
We start Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern here on Twitch, and we love people who drop in and take part in our chat room, The Lobby. If you're here live, remember to stick around as we continue the show after the double bell with more chat and some content that otherwise only our patrons get. All right, Sean just completely broke up for me, so hopefully that doesn't have an impact. All right, on to your... We got through mine, we're on to yours. Oh, and you shrunk down. Yeah, so I said, I, you yep. completely fell apart. I didn't even hear you finish. Hey, it's a good night tonight. Yeah, yeah. there, the, the text telling me I broke up. Yeah, it, it totally fell apart here. Yep. Skype is not playing along nicely. No, well, I mean, internet usage in general is up. It's definitely up. So what do we got in the chat so far? So, I saw uh, quite a bit flying by. Well, uh, uh, well, May Suggins was uh, a little confused. She thought when you mentioned the pri pile of shame was a shelf, that your pile of shame was actually small enough to fit on a single shelf. Oh, no, no. The, <laughs> the RPG pile of shame is completely different than the board game pile of shame. Yeah. I, I, the RPG, I, I own, it, if I consider PDFs, I now own over 2,000 RPGs. And of those, I probably played 10%. 20, 20 different systems is probably a rough guess. Maybe more than that, but not by a lot, to be yeah. honest. Yep. So, yeah, I, I don't know. It's it's a bookcase of shame, yep. to be honest. I, I don't track my played and unplayed RPGs. Yep. It's not something I've ever tracked. And, uh, Part of it, though, is RPGs you often buy just to read. Yep. I own many RPGs on my shelf that I would never even plan on running. I read them because they're interesting source books, or I wanted to see a lot of it when I first got into RPGs. I would buy them from the Dragon's Den just to see how a different company would do it. Like, how is this company do it different than TSR, or how is this different than D&D? So that was a big, big chunk of the stuff I bought back in the day. And then more modern, I tend to support friends. So I own an awful lot of RPG stuff, and I'm not saying their games are bad, but they're not necessarily in my wheelhouse that I picked up, purchased, kickstarted or picked up PDFs for at least to support uh, independent RPG content creators that I appreciate as people. So there's a lot of games in there I may never play. Yeah. Plus, well, we've heard me complain about my Monday night RPG group and how often we actually get together. So, yeah. Uh, and Major Kiela was pointing out, yeah, she, she too noticed that problem uh, in uh, Couriers, Couriers where yeah. you get, you get to the end and you've got this awesome stuff that you're never going to get to use. Yeah, you get the like you finally get the two dragons or whatever, and then you get them and you roll it and you went, oh, I I got uh, more ones. My dragon didn't get used, yeah. and I, I still like the the overall review. I see a weird saying didn't find it a problem, knowing it was going to be high random. And I admit it was still fun. I still liked Warriors. Actually, my review was overall very positive until I played Dice Master, which had a lot more in it to mitigate the randomness and the bad rolls on the dies weren't as useless because you didn't have the whole quiddity where you're dying from the market. So you would never buy like a Wolverine and just get garbage dice rolls on it. Wolverine was always useful. It, and that's where I, I preferred dice dice masters to couriers for a very similar system. Right. Continuing on. We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Our social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way is for questions to come through the website. We're not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. With the COVID-19 pandemic still in full effect, and most of us under stay-at-home orders, there are many of us who are stuck with no way to game. And there's the, some of us who, that, while getting in a bit of gaming with family, are missing out on regular game nights and aren't gaming nearly as much as we normally would. That, and there are some of us that are doing plenty of gaming still, but still need some way to fill in the time between game sessions, and that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Worthwhile, gaming-related things you can do that aren't playing games. All right, tonight we're going to be giving you some suggestions of things you can do between game sessions or between games. These include things that are just good for keeping you busy, as well as some things that you can do that'll be for the benefit of your future game sessions. These are all things that I enjoy doing between game sessions when I can get together or when I can't get together with my regular group or on weekends when there's no local gaming events or when I'm stuck at home for an extended period of time. This is something, um, I, I don't know who coined the term, but I always like the term. It's what I call gaming's lonely fun. 
Now, if you're isolated with another gamer, these can still be group activities if you're both burned out on games. Yep. All right, first thing you can do, because everyone loves to do this and play protected, is sleeve your cards. Now, I'm not personally a big card sleever myself. I prefer to play unprotected. But this is something that many gamers will do before they play their first game that includes any cards whatsoever. Small cards, big cards, little cards, tarot-sized cards. You can get sleeves for all types of cards. Fantasy Flight even has them color-coded, and you can get their own brands of cards. Sleeving cards, I find, can be quite zen and relaxing. For me, it's something I do while in front of the TV or while listening to podcasts. I need something else in the background, and then I just kind of mindlessly sleeve in cards. Definitely something that's hardly engrossing, but for many people, a vital detail to extend the life of their games. All right, another one. This one takes up a lot more time, can be almost a hobby in itself, and that is building box inserts. One of our first podcast episodes ever, this goes way back, is on whether we thought box inserts were worth it or not. And our final decision at the time was basically, if it means you're going to get the game to the table more often, it's worth building a box insert for it. And some games are so fiddly to put away and take out that a box insert makes a game that's got a half hour set up now set up in minutes. Now, there are all kinds of box inserts out there. You can buy them online from a variety of companies. Uh, the two most well-known out there, some of the first companies and still some of the best, are Meeple Realty and Broken Token. They do wooden inserts. Then there's Folded Space. They do much cheaper foam core inserts. There's Zen Bins that does plastic. Plus, if you head to Etsy, there are all kinds of independent shops doing wood, foam, and even 3D printed inserts. Now, if you have lots of time on your hand and you're a little more crafty than say maybe i am maybe now's the time to try building your own insert now you can wing it and just try to make your own but if you head over to board game geek there are many people there who have uploaded and share their own patterns for making box inserts uh, if you have access to foam core in particular mm -hmm. this seems to be the go-to material for many of the diy uh, folks on the bgg forums as it is much easier to work with than custom cutting wood uh, as Mo mentioned earlier, folded space uses foam core inserts, and we don't mean they're cheaper as in cheap, cheaply no. made. They're just cheap because they're less expensive because foam core is easier to work with than wood. Uh, yep. Also, as a big bonus with foam core, it's less likely to warp permanently over time, mm -hmm. though it's admittedly also not as sturdy and resilient as wood is generally. Yeah, another advantage of foam core, which I didn't think of at first, is how much lighter it is. Some of those bigger games, once you throw the insert in, holy cow, like my copy of Caverna, you could kill someone with that thing. Well, I mean, Gloomhaven was big enough to begin with. Before well, it already was, a, yeah. A, before you put a, wooded, a wooden insert in it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, next, organize your existing games. Organize a specific game. So even if you're not going to necessarily build a box insert, there are very few games out there that couldn't benefit from some type of organization inside the box. Now, this could just mean grabbing some resealable plastic bags, Ziploc bags, whatever you want to call them, or going as far as getting a Plano container or resealable containers or things to hold individual components or very th various other things that are out there to, to organize components, like using see, even pill bottles to hold things. There are lots of different options out there. Uh, Plano in particular, there is a, I'm going to throw this in the show notes, there is a Board Game Geek geek list for what Plano for which game. And they have like almost every game out there that you'd want to put a Plano in, it's which Plano to buy. And for people who don't know, Plano is a type of uh, organizer, kind of like fishing tackle box. Now a pro tip though, and one I should listen to myself, is if you're going to go with baggies or any of this, label it. Grab a permanent marker and write down what goes in what. That way when you're cleaning up, everyone knows where everything goes and belongs. This is something if I could find the time I need to do. I baggy all my stuff, I plano some stuff, I throw stuff in containers, but I never actually take the time to write down that time, that that what goes where. Yep. I'm sure there are plenty of folks out there who have pulled a box off the shelf only to open it up mm -hmm. and despair of getting it back onto the table because of how it was put away. This is this is a perfect time to get it set right so that you can look at the box and think of playing it with joy and not dread. I remember some of the early gaming events. I don't know if I should mention the specific gamers, but there was a particular gamer who bought the big uh, Fantasy Flight, tons of miniatures, tons of the counters games, and their cleanup method was literally put the box at the edge of the table and swipe. Ooh. And I was just like, oh my God, how could you 
do that. It's so I awful. mean, it's great for the end of the day, but it's horrible oh, for the start of the like, next one. And like, that's it. And that's how they would set up is they would basically do the 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 Tom Dra- Fassel drop. They would sit there and turn the box upside down and lift it up, and then all the players would start sorting through and grabbing their own colors and stuff. And I was oh. just like, oh. It, it gives me shivers just yeah, thinking no, that's, about it. That's not good. That's not good. And these are big games, like like Twilight Imperium, Chaos in the Old World, oh. lots of miniature games. Like, oh, it was insane. All right, up next, um, organize. We, we talked about organizing a specific game. How about organizing your whole collection? Besides just fixing the one, take everything off your shelves and put them back, basically. We, we have an entire episode about this. Again, I'll throw it in the show notes. I didn't bother grabbing episode numbers for this tonight but um we have all kinds of suggestions like there were some really interesting ones actually um alphabetical by genre by publisher by theme by player count like all kinds of interesting ways to organize your game collection so that when you're trying to decide what to play it's either easier to find or you reduce your collection to a subset so you're like i have four people we head to the four player shelf for the four player room depending on how big or small your collection is Though, if you're one of those people who organize your shelves by color, and I have seen your pictures on Twitter, you might have too much time, even in a lockdown, even before the lockdown situation. That's where you start rearranging it so it's not Roy G. Biv, but into some other color combination. <laughs> you know, you do the color wheel instead yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I've seen a couple of those, and yeah, I don't yeah, understand I've... how those people exist. I, I just don't. How do you find a game with it? <laughs> it looks great. The thing is, if, it, if I did something like that, what I would do is I would have a catalog. I, w- I would have some kind of, like, I don't know, binder or whatever I would grab, and I would look up Robo Rally, and it would say gray. Or first <laughs> printing red, or second printing green, because, well, that's actually the colors. Yeah. Or you could just be like me and actually remember what color every box of games come in. I don't think I remember all of them, though. <laughs> all right, let's say you're going to do this. You're going to rearrange your collection. This is also a good time to call your collection. Go through the games you own and see if you really need to own all of them. Has one game replaced another game, so you'll never play the original anymore, sometimes called the Jones Theory? Are there games that you find broken or that you've solved? Like, you know what? We played that so many times. Every time we play, the person who plays, I'm going to use an example of Dominion. Oh, yeah, the big money thing. Without expansions, you just go big money and big money wins. I'm sick of playing Dominion because every time we play, Dave plays big money. Or do you have legacy games that you finished or one-shot games, right? Uh, We'll be talking about one later tonight, one of the exit games. Do we still have the box for that game here? Do we need it? Why Why not get rid of it? Now, what you do with them is up to you, actually. It's one of the topic suggestions we've gotten is how to call and what to do with games. I don't know if we'll ever deep dive into it, but just quickly, I'd say you could sell them. You can donate them to local libraries or schools, which I think is a better suggestion, depending on how badly you need the money. If you need the money, sell them. That's totally fine. Use it to buy more games. Um, trade them with other people. Get part in a mass trade. But with what's going on right now with the pandemic, just because of what's going on right now, I would actually suggest offering them to other locals who may not have much of a gaming library to give them something to do. Like This is a chance to contact your neighbors and say, hey, do you people play board games? You know what? I'm going to drop this off on your porch. Check it out. Or if you're actually socializing with some close people, close to you people, perhaps you give them the game and show them how to play. But you could offer to do it over Skype or something like that if it's something a little more complicated. Just remember that the virus lives for a day on cardboard and three days on plastic. So if you pass on a game, remember to suggest you get isolated for a few days just to be safe. Yeah, or at least wipe it down, right? Like, make sure they wipe it down. But yeah, what's if if you if the person didn't have much of a game collection, I'm sure they can wait one more day before trying up something else. Now, another way to um, improve the games you have. So this is something you can do in your downtime to make the games you own better, and that is to find or create some player aids. Uh, this could be anything. This could be reference cards, scoring sheets, turn summaries. Uh, We've mentioned Esoteric Order of Gamers many times in the show, and I still do strongly recommend them, but they have not done every game. Uh, Board Game Geek, almost every game I've ever looked up has some kind of rule summary out there, except Shafosa. That was the one exception. Proves the rule. Uh, Personally, I would do that. I would check Esoteric, and I would check Board Game Geek first, but that's just so you're not recreating the wheel. You're not working on something that's already been done. But the other thing you could do, too, is if you've got the time, is find all multiples of these and create a best of, whatever's most useful for your group. Especially if you're teaching games, uh, you're the game teacher. The other thing you can work on is teaching sheets. Now, I know Edward from Heavy Cardboard actually offers his online, and that's literally his script he uses while teaching games. Now, you could use Edward's, or you can create your own. 
But these are all things you can do that you're going to spend time now that's going to make your time when you game more enjoyable, run ba better, run faster, and make the games, get more games to the table. Well, another great solution for games you might not get to the table often enough for dread of teaching or rule memory. All right, another one. Uh, this kind of goes with cards leaving. I probably could have put it in together, but I didn't think of it at the same time, is to protect the components of the games you have. Uh, now that you got player aids that you just printed off, you created some shiny new player aids, laminate them. At the same time, laminate those roll and write sheets. Laminate a scorecard. Why burn through that pad? If you're ever worried about you running out the pad, just laminate one of them. Throw in some dry erase, wet erase markers, whatever you prefer to use in the box. And then the next time you go to play, you don't have to worry about running out of character sheets. Uh, RPG side, character sheets, monster stat cards, um, people who play like War Machine Hordes, you can laminate those cards to take them off. Miniature gamers, you got your army sheets. Pretty much there's anything you're going to write on is worth laminating, plus anything that you worry about is going to get damaged. So if it's thin. So another example is like the, the player boards in Terraforming Mars. If you haven't got the new awesome upgraded ones from Board Game Geek or the Kickstarter, if you still got the old school one, they're worth laminating just because they're pretty thin and they can get easily damaged. Now, along with that, there's other things you could do, like Red Meeple Ryan in our chat room has recommended many times is coin capsules. These are perfect for small chits, whether it's money or resources or corn and Zolkin or whatever. These are small round capsules for holding coins, collectible coins that you can put your game components in. Another one, this one I learned from um, Snakes and Lattes in Toronto, is using Tester's Dull Coat on your boards. So you get some spray varnish and hit your game boards, and if you wish, your player pieces, your meeple, your wooden tokens and stuff like that, just to give them that extra level of coating. Now, no Tester's Dull Coat. Some people do claim yellows over time, but it does take 20 to 30 years. So if you think you're going to be playing your game for that long, Fair enough, you may not want to use it, but there aren't a lot of games I own that I play that long. And again, if I've played a game for 30 years, unless it's a, a collector's item, it's time to go buy a new copy of Catan or whatever that popular game is. Uh, though if you don't already have a laminator, you might want to hold off a bit and wait for a sale or stores to reopen rather than shipping things like that around uh, unnecessarily. All right, up next is painting, miniature painting. Uh, my camera's not quite at the right angle to show off all the unpainted miniatures I have, but you know what? All those Games Workshop boxes back there are filled with them too. Um, many of today's most popular games include miniatures. Miniatures are now a common feature of game, and they aren't necessarily always figures. They could be resources. They could be buildings. They could be anything. Plastic pieces have pretty much replaced wood in a lot of games. Plus, even wooden pieces could use a bit of paint and sprucing up. This is uh, painting miniatures, a longtime hobby of mine, something I started way back in the 80s, something I find extremely relaxing and zen. It takes up a lot of time, because personally, I find when I'm painting, the time just flies by. Like, I don't realize how much has gone by. Now, you don't have to be any good to improve the overall look of a game. Miniatures are going to be more than arm's length away in general when you're playing a game. They don't have to look perfect. Now, if you're not willing to go whole hog and totally paint your miniatures, the other thing to suggest is just putting an ink wash on your miniatures or doing what they call a dip is another a more modern term for it. And that'll really help a miniature pop where you just add some darkness into the recesses and really get you to see the, the details on the miniatures without having to, you know, paint the cloak and paint the things all different colors and make them look like they're supposed to and everything like that. If some of the hosts of this show are actually not working still throughout yeah. this, they could certainly take this advice and make some good oh. use of it. Oh, I definitely would. Imperial Assault would probably be where I'd start. Start painting some Stormtroopers, start with Stormtroopers, move on, and then once my, my skills have uh, gotten back to what they used to be, at least, if not better, start working on, like, characters, because I wouldn't want to try to start with a Han Solo, but, you know, a bunch of, bunch of white and black Stormtroopers to start. And also, Danielle in the chat room is pointing out that craft stores with curbside pickup and some bulk stores do carry laminators, so. Yep. Uh, technically, office supply stores are considered essential, so they are open. Uh, well, in, in Ontario, they are anyway. In I'm Ontario, sure yeah, it's depending, true, depending on where you're at. But um, Staples would have, they, I don't know if they do curbside or delivery. All right, talking about painting miniatures leads me to blinging out your board games. Your favorite game doesn't have minis. It has meeples. Maybe go get some minis or find some minis for it or swapping those resource cubes for 3D printed resources or resources made of clay. Uh, Stonemeyer Games is famous for putting out these resin and clay resource replacements. 
That round marker in the networks is just a little peg. Wouldn't it be so much cooler if it was a small TV from a dollhouse set? Just think of things you could do to make your games look cooler. Scoring, scoring markers and bean hosts as little mini wine bottles instead of cubes. There are all kinds of cool things you can do to improve the table presence of your existing games to just make them pop. And I've got to say, I personally find the games more engaging when you have these things. Yeah, so, and supporting artists on Etsy. If you can't figure out or don't have the resources to make adjustments yourself is a great way to help people make it through these tough times. Though we're also aware that you may be having some of those tough times yourself right now. Yeah, very fair. Yeah, Etsy has all kinds. Almost any board game you search for, you'll find some kind of improvements. If you've got a friend with a 3D printer right now, and if they're bored, you could totally give them lots of stuff to do. All right, something else that I find useful to do between game sessions is refreshing myself on the rules. This is the perfect time to figure out if you've been playing your games correctly or playing the extreme versions. Once I get a new game, after the first play, I'd like to review the rules, see what's mixed, what I messed up. There's always something. After about two, three more plays, no matter how much time has passed, I usually like to go back at least once more and check the rules again. Usually by the time I get to two, three plays, sometimes it's just two weeks later, I'll take a look at it. And it is amazing how many games I have played wrong and just little rules I've missed. Now, with RPGs, I find this even more important because most RPGs have thick, tome-like rule books, and it's almost impossible for someone to remember all the rules. Every few sessions, I actually like to take out my core rule books for whatever game I'm running and at least flick through it with a focus on stuff I know is coming up. For example, if I know in the next adventure my players are going to be getting on a boat, it's time to check those naval travel times and the rules for swimming and drowning. I mean, if you want to read them from cover to cover, go ahead. We're not going to say not to, but it's really what we're talking about is refreshing new, concerning, or upcoming details for uh, for current plays. And especially we talked about, um, at some point, rulings over rules and just making a call with it and whether a house, in our episode about house rules. And this is that, that chance, too, that once you made a house rule, go back and check what the actual rule is. Now, along with RPGs, there's your regular session prep. One of the things that make uh, RPGs different than board games is the fact that there is work to do while you're not actually playing the game. And this can be for both the, the DM, GM, and the players, depending on what exact game you're playing. But there's all kinds of time you can spend to prep for the next game. Now, what I would do is, thinking of this, like expanding some time, there's warm room to prep. This is where I'm going to map some dungeons, maybe make a relationship map, stat out some NPCs, create new monsters, maybe even make some props for your game. This is where you think, you know what, my game's great and it's going really well, but you know what would make it over the top is to do X and then sit there and do that X, that extra thing that's just going to make the game even better next time. Yeah, and with online gaming, there's all sorts of scripting and things you can get into with Roll20 and other systems. So you can maybe take things to the next level if you've just so far been doing the same sort of thing you would at the table, but using an online system. You know, there, there's other levels you can take it to if you if you really want to delve into that. Yeah. Now, another suggestion RPG related is to make your own DM screen or GM screen, depending on which, which term you prefer. I personally like having a screen. I don't sit behind it. I sit beside it, but I like having the useful information in front of me. But what I found over time, especially... And at first, like, I, I, companies seem to be really good at giving you the info you need when you first start running a game. The thing is, once I've run a game for a year or even two months or even five sessions, some of that stuff I find I don't need. Meanwhile, there's something I keep looking up in the book every session. So now's the time to make your own screen. Now, there's lots of things out there online for how to make your own DM screen, but mainly you're just going to sit there and go through and find the tables, charts, things you need, the reminders, random sets of NPC names, whatever you find is useful for you at the table. Now, this can also go for players, though you don't see it often. Dungeons & Dragons actually published them player screens for each of the things. So if you were a fighter, it had all the weapons and it had all the feats listed and it had all the stuff just for fighters on there and all the special moves, right? The trip and sunder and trip and how all those work. Trip, sunder, I don't even remember all the different moves. Push, the five-foot shove. Now, I'm thinking 3.5 rules here, but whatever edition it happens to be. And those, like, they came out and I think people didn't like them and they never went anywhere, but I think they're brilliant. I think player screens are just as valid as DM screens, though your DM might get upset if you try to roll behind the screen, but then your DM shouldn't be rolling behind the screen that often either. That's a matter of personal preference. 
I personally think player aids aren't just for board games and can be just as valid for role playing games. Absolutely. I mean, it depends. Some people might consider uh, their player sheet a a uh, a, a player screen mm. of a sort. Some some of the character sheets really get in depth and have a lot of that information on there. So if you've got you know a three page character sheet, mm. you may have all that character information on there. Or maybe you want to build yourself a new character sheet that mm -hmm. has all that information on there. Um, there's a million character sheets out there. Making mm -hmm. your own to be a million and one isn't a bad thing if it's got the information you need right there in front of you. It's going to mm -hmm. make the games flow smoother. And that means you can be more creative and focus less on the roles and more on your role. Plus, even the act of doing it is going to help you remember those roles. That's always just the, the the physical act of going through this. And the same thing for making the board game uh, player aids. It's just doing it is going to help you remember the rules for the game more. All right, how about you got lots of time? Again, I'm thinking RPGs mainly here because they're the ones you need to do this for. you got a ton of time. Why not learn a new system? Now, there are many of us, and I think our chat room mostly falls along in this vein, that jump around from RPG system to RPG system playing various one-shots, trying out different systems all the time, but there are a large number of RPG gamers out there that stick to what they know, and there's nothing wrong with that. I have no problem with it. I know people who just play AD&D 2nd Edition have since the 90s and don't plan on ever changing. But you know what? A period of downtime between campaigns or while we're stuck socially isolating is the perfect time to try something new. Learn a new system. Read the rules. Make some sample characters. Run through a mock adventure. Look online for solo adventures. Come back to your group excited about something new and interesting when you can get together again. Break out something completely from surprise. Though, again, get buy-in. Like, let people know before we start, no, I'm going to kill our old campaign and we're trying something new. Get that enthusiastic buy-in before you start going. But now's the time. Like, if you've had that DCC rule book, which I got to say, the things like this stick, sitting on your shelf, and you're like, man, I always wondered. Or in my case, like, role master. If I had, if again, if I wasn't working, if I had the time, painting miniatures and like learning to play Role Master would be a good goal for me at this point because I have had the Role Master standard system since my friend Al McDade bought it for me in 1990s with the promise I had to run it for him someday, and I never did follow through on that. You know, and now's the time to do it, and then get a hold of Al on Skype and run some Role Master for him. Well, and another uh, op option is finding some actual play campaigns either in video or in audio mm -hmm. form which can help you get into that new system. And it also helps to support those creators as well. Yep, very true. All right, the last one I've got on the list uh, for today, and I'm sure there are more, we'll be checking in with the lobby to see what they have. I saw a couple scroll by as we were talking, is to play games, but solo games, games for yourself, right? You can't get together with your regular group. You can't get to your, your weekend game nights canceled. There's no local gaming events, it's just you. There are many solo games out there. Now these can include solo board games. So what I was kind of thinking here as something different was setting up a multiplayer game and playing multiple sides or fighting through an RPG combat where you control all the combatants or doing any of those things where you're just to, to, to learn a rule system or to learn a game for the first time. It's a great way is to play or to improve your skills. Like you've seen it many, many times where people play both sides in chess to get better at playing chess. That's just as valid with other board games. That way, you're ready to go and ready to kick butt when you get back to your normal group. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, if you check in on Board Game Geek, many isolated gamers have come up with solo variants for games oh, yeah. that weren't originally intended that way to give you other options. As well, uh, game uh, systems like the uh, Tabletop Simulator allow mm -hmm. you to play well as multiple players, essentially, if you'd like to. So you can set up a game with four players of Azul and play Azul to to get better if, if you if you really want to. Uh, yep. There's a lot of options out there, uh, either built, designed in the game, or figured out by other people to let you uh, work on your strategies. Plus, RPGs, too. There are a growing number of solo RPGs. They used to be very rare. Like, there was two or three, and you could, I could name them all. It's been a long time since then. There are a number, a growing number of solo RPGs out there nowadays. There are a lot of games that you can play by yourself. And, of course, the last one, so this gets into now you're playing games with your friends is play online. But that gets into a totally different topic, one we will try to tackle at a future segment. Well, now that we're done with our thoughts on the main topic, we're going to head over to the lobby. We're diving to answering your questions live. Uh, Ryan mentions uh, 
but uh, you know, as an option for uh, as an option for your your DM screen, you can just use three iPads with different. Uh, well, if you happen to have three iPads, <laughs> not a terrible idea if you have them. Like I have one. I oh, and Mo's locking up on us as soon as we go into the lobby. The lobby does not like Mo tonight. Wow. No idea what he's saying. Not at all. Some neat stuff where they, oh, they pulled and over. You're back, pulled you're back now. You were completely gone. All right. We have no idea what you said. Uh, That's awesome. And you're shrunk. At least I waited till the lobby. I waited till the lobby. It did. I it doesn't matter. Waited. Don't we leave the lobby in at this point? Usually we do, yes. Yeah. Oh, what is going on tonight? Right, so I, I noted, I noted uh, owning three iPads would be a, a bit surprising. But basically, I made my own DM screen. There was this thing that used two binders, and there was two ring binders, and it used um, it's sleep it's protectors. Sleep protectors. Sleep protectors, and he used binder clips, and the binder clips held the binders together. But they were also like they put them in smart places so that like the metal piece that you flip up would hold your sheets in place, so they don't like flap in the wind and everything. Right. And it worked great. And then they used the binders where you could slide stuff in, so the front side was supposed to be player stuff, and then the DM side was ones you could flip, and you could flip the pages. But like you would flip the page, but then you would use these binder clips to hold it in place. Like it was actually really brilliant. And you know what? If I can find the YouTube video, I'll throw it in the in the show notes. Uh, this was a long time ago. <laughs> like, YouTube was still pretty new at the time. And the person was running some uh, anarchy cyberpunk game that made them. But it... Yeah. I made a... Uh, so what else? We got uh, Solo Tic-Tac-Toe. There we go. Uh, <laughs> Cat's Dream is a good one for Solo. Sorry, what was? Cat's Dream, uh, Mage Kale is saying, good one for Solo RPG. All right, I saw Red Meeple Ryan had like seven different things to do. Uh, yeah, yep. Uh, he was he was trying to see how many of them uh, that we did. Uh, I don't know how close we got. I know last uh, week you on shop online call. for component upgrade bits. Chat on social media about games and gaming. Start That's a game nice. podcast. You know what? Go online. Talk to other people about gaming. That is definitely something you can do. There are multiple discords out there. There's Facebook and Twitter, though I don't know how much you want to be on those. They can be a bit toxic at times. Uh, Discord generally tends to be, I find, uh, at least you join a, 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 what would you call it, directed, a specific, a themed Discord channel. So far, and well moderated. Those are worth doing. Yep. Uh, Cat Stream is apparently inspired by Studio Ghibli. Cool. Start a podcast. There you go. Anchorcast is supposedly really simple to get started with, but they own all your stuff. So if you're okay with people owning your content, other than you, AnchorCast, I hear, is the way to go. I also hear it's really easy to monetize. Danielle is uh, currently doing a GM boot camp to be on a demo team for a system and learning for another system so that she can write for that system soon and for community fair, content. Fair, cool. Way to keep, uh, way keep busy. On the, write your own game. That could totally go on the list. Yep. Now the time. Sit down, write your own role-playing game. Either, either from scratch or join one of the many game jams that are going on right now. There's always so many of those happening. Um, I think Itch.io I th seems to be a place where a lot of people are doing some game jam stuff. I'm not uh, super familiar with uh, what's going on over there, but I see a lot of uh, content creators talking about it and using it. Yeah, Itch is very popular. That's where a lot of the people we used to follow on drive through are now on Itch. Right. Yeah, make your own game write your own game create your own game that roger should be in the chat he's all about making his own games <laughs> all righty all right i think we're good a couple quick announcements before we continue we keep growing with the support of fans like you so please take a minute to subscribe leave a like hit a bell or just leave a comment we like most creators grow only by your interaction with us plus we crave validation Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I send out an email recapping all the content we released the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, YouTube videos, actual plays, whatever it is we've made, we throw in there in the newsletter. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com. All right. Earlier today at 3 p.m. Eastern, that's our time, New York time, Toronto time, 
Dan and I took part in a Renegade Games sponsored worldwide game day event. Now, Renegade is doing these every Wednesday in April so far. They may continue on. And each event, they feature one of their most popular games. Today's game was Fox in the Forest, a two-player trick-taking game. So what's neat about these events is that during them, Renegade Games sends out worldwide events that affect everyone who's playing. So, for example, today, while we were playing Fox in the Forest, all of a sudden, Renegade came into our chat and noted, Worldwide event! Whoever's birthday is in the first half of the year, their next card is plus one, and whoever's birthday is in the second half of the year, you get a minus one. That wasn't that one was kind of neat. There was a who last folded laundry, um, who last read a fairy tale, which actually fits in with the game a little bit better, and other things that gave modifiers. One was if you send a picture of your game state right now with this hashtag on Twitter, score two points. It was kind of a neat little thing to throw in that made the gameplay a little more interesting and a little more interactive than usual. And it reminds me of something I did years ago with the Gamma World role-playing game where they, the Wizards of the Coast sent out worldwide events to the game stores. And I thought it was kind of cool. Now, the entire thing was neat. Um, we're going to try to take part in these each week. The thing is, next week's game is Bargain Hunter? Bargain Quest. Sorry, Bargain Quest. I meant to put that in notes. Bargain Quest, which is from Renegade Games, and it's a game where you play the shopkeepers in a fantasy D&D-style setting, and you are trying to sell your wares to adventurers who are about to go out adventuring. Unfortunately, I don't own that game, so I'm not going to be taking part next week, but if people are interested, head over to renegadegames.com. You can find out all about it. They're using hashtag Worldwide Play Day for these events, and if you own a copy of Bargain Quest, you can play along with everyone else in the world at noon PST or 3 p.m. Eastern, our time. All right. I'm good. I got coffee now. Up next, we're taking a spoiler-free look at Exit, the House of Riddles from Tames and, Com and Cosmos. All right, first off, in an effort to be 100% transparent, I do have to say that I did receive a review copy of House of Riddles from Thames and Cosmos. I have no other compensation. They didn't pay me. They just gave me a copy of the game. Now, Exit the Game, The House of Riddles, was designed by Inca and Marcus Brand, a husband and wife team, and I think they did all the Exit games, but at least they've done the ones I've played. Uh, the features art by Sylvia Kristoff and Michaela Kuhn. Uh, was published in 2017, so this is one of the older ones, but not the oldest, uh, by, again, Thames and Cosmos. Playing times listed as 45 to 90 minutes, designed to play, according to the box, one to four players, well, being best at two. Now, I personally say you should also wipe out that one. Yeah, I think you need more than one player and more about why than in a little bit. Yeah, normally, we would point you to an unboxing video at this point in the review, and Mo considered doing one, but we found that people were worried about spoilers, and we chose not to for that reason. Yeah, I was strongly considering it, because like, there's nothing in there you can't see on the back of the box. But you know what? People were worried I'd flip a card or show something off, so fair enough. So now House of Riddles is the second exit game uh, we have played. The first was The Secret Lab. Now you can read my thoughts on The Secret Lab over on the blog. Uh, there was a podcast, we talked about it too, but I didn't do a formal review on the podcast. Now the components in that game are very similar to the components in this one. And I have to assume now having played two of those and seen the backs of the boxes of other ones, that the components are pretty much the same in most exit games. Um, and I'm going to let you know what's in there. I personally don't think it's a spoiler. If you go on Amazon or on Cosmos, you can see everything that comes in this box. So I'm just going to tell you the, the physical components. So you get a short instruction book, another booklet that you're told not to open that has a, a house on it. There's some different stacks of cards and then some interesting what they call unusual items. And the unusual items change in ex every exit game. Now, there is more than one stack, of, one more stack of cards than the other set. Um, there's a set of black-backed cards that are unique to this set that are different from the other one. Now, the unusual items are, there's a couple things on a thin punch board. There's this black shape. That's about the best I can describe it. There's a little magnifying glass where there's a slot cut out where the glass would be. And then there's a small blue ball uh, made of wood. So, a nice little assortment of uh, items that could be anything and really don't, yeah. really don't help anyone, but uh, yeah. give you the set for which you can uh, figure out how to escape. Yeah. Now, the instructions are written so that you read them through as you play the game for the first time. Basically, one of your four, up to four players would read through the rules. Starts off with the setup, which, again, this is right in the front. This isn't a spoiler. Your group arrives at the House of Riddles. You're there to meet three detectives. Each detective set up a puzzle room for you to make your way through. 
to get through these rooms, you're going to have to solve 10 riddles. And again, 10 riddles is a common theme in all of the exit games. Every exit game that's been published is involves 10 riddles. Now, to play the game, you start a timer. You open the first page of that book. On that first page, you should be able to find a clue card that you need to draw. These are blatantly obvious. Every exit game has it. It generally tends to be the A card. Between that clue card and what you're looking at in the book, you need to figure out something that will give you a three-digit code. Once you've got the code, you put it on a code wheel. Now, these code wheels are going to give flashbacks to anyone who's my and Sean's age who remembers playing text adventures on their PCs, because this is what we used to have to do for copy protection. And that is what these are. It's one of those wheels. It's got three spins, and you put in your code, and it's going to give you a number. You're going to take that number. You're going to go through the answer deck and pull out that card, and it's going to tell you you're right or wrong. And if you're wrong, you just keep trying to figure out the puzzle. If you're right, it's going to send you to another card. That other card's going to tell you what to do next. You keep going on until you've solved all 10 puzzles. Stop the clock, get your reward, and figure out your final score. Simple enough. If at any time you're stuck, there are a set of clue cards. There are three clue cards for each of the 10 riddles, so a total of 30 cards. They're set up, so there's one, two, and three clues for each. The first clue just tells you if you have everything you need to solve the puzzle. So it just lists everything you have to have access to. This is useful to make sure you didn't miss something obvious. The second clue will give you a hint, and the third clue gives you the actual answer to the riddle. Your final score is based on how much time you took and the number of clue cards you used to finish the puzzle. Now, because we have played Secret Lab, we started off the House of Riddles already understanding the format. Like, there's just a certain style that the puzzles have in these exit games. And that really helped us get up and running, get going really quickly. We immediately knew what we were looking for, and the first puzzle made it very obvious how to get that information. Like, well, we know we're looking for this, and oh, there it is right in front of us. We just got to do some, put the pieces in order to get the answer. Now, what was surprising is this continued as we completed puzzle after puzzle, drew more cards, and flipped through the book. Most of the puzzles were extremely straightforward. Like, not only was it obvious what you're looking for, but where to find that information. It was more about going through the process. To be honest, of the 10 puzzles in this, only two really gave us any pause or made us even have to stop and think and consult with each other. Well, I mean, puzzle makers in general have styles. Even crossword uh, designers or writers you know, generally have a style. If, if, you're, if you're, you, you can tell who has written a crossword puzzle if you're, mm -hmm. if you're that kind of person. Now, unfortunately, I wonder if this could be a concern uh, as as a as a gamer and not a, just a, a general person, as a gamer, if you've played one from these designers, uh, could the rest end up being too easy for this very reason that you sort of figured out their style and can roll through it, steamroller style? In a way, I, I think so. The the whole thing is all the exit games have the same basic format where you are trying to find the same. You're trying to find three things, the order of those three things, what those three things are, which leads you to the next clue. Once you know that. Like when we first started the secret lab, a lot of the time at the beginning was just trying to figure out what the heck to do. Like, like we've got this booklet that, that you're allowed to, one, one of the changes, I think I get to this in a second, is you're allowed to look through the entire book in the secret lab. So you are just presented with like seven pages of clues and you have no idea which one you need first. Whereas House of Riddles was significantly easier than that. For one, you open the book to the first page and it warns you, do not flip the page until you finish this puzzle. So you know everything you need to know is on this page. Yeah. And yes, it is. Like, it's obvious. Like, there's no no lateral thinking here. There's no thinking outside the box. You know everything you need is right there. Whereas in the secret lab, you're like, I don't know where to start. Like, my clue card gives you this. And another thing is each puzzle was also self-contained. So even when you're on puzzle six, all you have is everything for puzzle six. You have the clue cards for puzzle six. You have what page to be open. You might have one of those unusual objects in your hand. But you know all of that is needed for Puzzle 6. When you're done, you can put all that aside. Now, again, Secret Lab was different. Secret Lab, you might have two or three puzzles going concurrently and not know which parts you need. And it might be that you need to solve Puzzle 2 to get the clue you need to finish Puzzle 1, which will actually lead you to Puzzle 3. Whereas this was very much solve Puzzle 1, solve Puzzle 2, solve Puzzle 3, solve Puzzle 4. So this had some interesting effects. Like one of the downfalls in house of riddles with only having one puzzle at a time is only one person could really work on it like as, as especially if there was anything physical right like if you had to color something or connect lines or cut something only one person could be doing that while with secret lab it could be 
here, you work on the flag puzzles. I'm going to work on this puzzle. After a while, maybe we'll tra trade if we haven't solved it. Now, yes, you had two brains. Like, we had two of us looking at each puzzle, so there was that aspect. But I, it didn't – I don't know. It, it, I worry that if we had had four people, two of the people would have been bored. Like, they, they just – like, it's too many heads trying to crowd on something. Right. And also, there aren't multiple copies of things. So unless you bought multiple copies, which I would don't recommend in any way, there's no way you can each hold and look at the thing, right? There's only the one thing to look at. Now, I would say that this one even would be great one player. But there is one puzzle in here that specifically requires two people or a group to be able to play. Now, I don't want to spoil anything, but I will say there's this charade element to it, which actually I found was rather neat. I can't see being able to solve that solo. Maybe with a mirror, I don't know. Like, I, we didn't try it solo. So, I, I again, I don't want to spoil anything. But because of that one puzzle, I don't think the box should say one player whatsoever. It should say two to four. It's almost like they've they've sort of come up with a system, build, building out that system with a, with a bunch of different options and different themes, uh, yep. and, and maybe didn't think about the fact that this one little thing they designed doesn't quite fit the mold that they've built yes. themselves. Well, I have a feeling they probably put one to four on every box. Yeah, well, that's what every, I mean. Like they, they built this, yeah. this, this, you know, set of, of things that they're doing and, you know, X number yeah. of puzzles that involve this number of things and, you know, a, a system to build it. Yeah. That, uh, and then this one cool thing they came up with uh -huh. doesn't quite work as well as they thought yeah. it should. Like it, it literally says, like, your partner. Right. I, I don't want to, I think Deanna even gave away a little bit more in the chat there. But it actually says, like, you know, do this with your partner. Right. So now, overall, it was fun. Like, it was neat. I, I do, I love, I like the, the, the thing. It definitely helped knowing what to expect. That was a huge part of why we found this easy. But overall, it was just too easy. Like, we never felt challenged. Um, for all but two of the puzzles, we literally figured out the second we flipped over the riddle card. It was like, oh, here's this picture. Oh, here's this riddle card. Oh, obviously, we have to connect these two things. Oh, flip this over. Oh, oh, those are the, we're going to cut those out and do this with it. Oh, flip that over. Oh, no, well, this is easy. We're going to do this. Oh, wait. Oh, what's this? You know, like that happened a couple times. Um, Now, I do have to say, we compare, I, I keep mentioning comparing it to Secret Lab and how Secret Lab was more difficult for multiple reasons. Like I said the biggest being you didn't know what clue went with what. Like you had multiple things going on at once and you had to piece them together. And there was that whole A leads to B leads to C, which makes sense. So it's kind of neat. Like you may have the clue for A that you got in the first room. And you're trying to solve it. Well, it ends up you need something for three rooms later, which is cool, which totally worked. But it's harder. But you know what? Once I looked at it, I went and looked up the difficulty. Now, House of Riddles is a two out of five. All these games are ranked as a difficulty out of five. Secret Labs is a 3.5 out of five. So it's not only over the hill, right? Like if, if three is your mid mark, it's over that by a, a margin. You're at 3.5 out of five. So it makes sense that this would be easier. Now, between the two of us, we finished in 45 minutes, whereas the perfect score is under half, under an hour. I would say, too, that it was probably closer to half an hour because of the amount of time spent cutting. There were fiddly things you had to use scissors to cut out, and that took, like, 15 minutes, probably, worth of cutting in this game. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, Angie Games and, and uh, Mitch Kayla in the chat room were talking, and I think I tend to agree that, really, I think the exit games are aimed at a more general audience and less specifically hobby gamer audience. I think I think you may be on the scale of problem solving a little more uh, advanced, especially when you've done multiple uh, yeah. boxes. I don't, as I said, it's also the difficulty. Like looking at, I just wouldn't get a difficulty two ever again. To me, two, two's too easy for us. Right. Whereas Secret Lab, definitely like it, it took us more than an hour. It took us time. Like there was... There were puzzles that took us a while to solve. We did get through it. Um, we didn't. We had to use clues, but we only had to use clues because there was a uh, errata. There was a typo. Um, but this time, we didn't even touch the clue deck. Now, I got to say, one thing that was neat in this was the end game reward. I actually thought was really cool. It was just a neat thing that they did. I really don't want to. I, I want to spoil it. <laughs> uh, for those of you who are going to stick around for the after show, if you want to know what the reward is, I thought it was very neat. I thought it was a cool thing, but I don't want to give it away. Um, it wasn't neat enough to justify grabbing House of Riddles. If you if if you found Secret Lab about the right level, you're gonna find this too easy. I, I gotta admit, 
it wasn't that fulfilling. Like, like, yeah, the reward was neat, but like, it was just too easy. Like, like literally like flip it, flip it. Oh, we have to do this, do it. Oh, flip it. Flip, yeah. Yeah. Cut this out. Do this. Yep. Done it. Okay. Color this in. Done it. Like it was that simple. It was just like immediately obvious. It reminded me of my kids going through a puzzle book where you just flip it and it doesn't even need to tell you at the bottom of the page. You just immediately start connecting the dots or coloring in the, the different shapes. Uh, I am kind of glad that this was a review copy that I didn't pay the like full price. These are fifteen ninety nine US. I'm kind of like I like to compare it to a night out at the movies. This didn't feel as fun as a night out at the movies. Yeah, well, I mean, with Night Out of the Movies, you expect to get a couple of hours of fun. 45 minutes is, is pretty short for a night, you know, a night of the movie right. type Without price. the challenge, right? Like, yeah, yeah. It, it, like, like, I didn't feel great that we got it done in 45. It was like, yeah, we rocked that. If I had had that feeling, then maybe it's a little better than going to watch the latest Star Wars movie. Now, on a positive note, I think this might be the great entry point. Because what we struggled with at the Secret Lab was the, what are we trying to do? Like, like if you've never played an exit game, you're like, I don't know. This was so clear on what you had to do. Like, it was just blatantly obvious. Here it is on the first page. You're going to do this to get you this answer that lets you progress. Secret Lab did not have that, and we fumbled. And it was a little frustrating at the start, which is fine. But I think if you were going to buy an exit game for the first time, this might be a great intro. I think it's a better intro than Secret Lab. Now, Secret Lab was the first one they published, which is why I bought it. So that's what I'm thinking is this is a great intro one. Plus, I also think it might be good if you were playing with kids. Like, I think we could have grabbed Big G to play this one. And she could have easily done some of the puzzles with us. So I think this one had more of a family feel to it. So I would say at this point, if you haven't tried an exit game, I do recommend the series. They are fun. This might be a great entry point. But if you played any before, I'd only suggest this. If you played, say, the Secret Lab, again, is a 3.5. If you played a 3.5 and found it frustrating and difficult, here's a way to step down. Like, it, it, everyone thinks differently. Everyone has different skills. Everyone's better or worse at problem solving. Puzzles aren't everyone's forte. Maybe Deanna and I are really good at them. I don't know. I, I, I like to think we're smart people. Maybe we're brilliant. We piled through this, and you'd have more difficulty with it. But it, just comparing that Secret Lab being their first one, being the 3.5 part, if you found that at all easier, got through that in an hour to an hour and a half, I think this is you're just going to blow through it. All right. Now, before we wrap this up, I also want to talk about the Cosmos Helper app. So one of the things we did different this exit game playthrough was we tried out the Cosmos Helper app. Now, this is a generic app for all the Cosmos games. And it just has a list of, I don't know if it's every game they publish, but an awful lot of the games they publish. And each game will have different types of support. So for the exit games, there is literally a separate app for every exit game, which is kind of impressive, uh, including House of Riddles. Now, it includes two things that you get to choose from. One's a tutorial, and the second is a themed timer. Now, the tutorial seemed excellent. It completely replaces the rulebook from the box, introduces you to the game, gives you the background story with some, like, back sounds in the background and a guy with a British voice reading it off a little, you know, possibly more impressive than someone else at the table telling you the story. And then shows you how to play, like, in detail, with examples, with stop and do this now, and has you open your box and set up your box and put the cards out and put uh, separate everything into piles and literally walks you through. This is great for visual learners. Plus, it adds some neat things, the neat, neat atmosphere. But... It didn't match. The story was completely off. The story in the app said you are traveling by yourself to a castle to explore the surrounding territory. And then another part of the app mentions there's three detectives. You're going to try to save three detectives named Justice, Peter, and Bob. Well, the game we played, there were three detectives, but they were completely different names, which just was really odd. We had to rescue Sandra, Mario, and Tom. This is, and, this is sounding a lot like uh, Lopan, Legacy of Lopan all over again. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So so I don't get it. Like It was just weird. Like It was perfect for teaching us how to play, but we had to throw everything that told us about the story. Like, yeah, there's three detectives, but like, and, and Sandra, Mario, and Tom were referenced multiple times. The other names we never heard again. It was weird. And, and we weren't in a castle. We were in a house. And it was talking about going through the countryside and exploring these different castles. So I don't know if they recorded, the, like, are there two exit games where you're trying to save detectives? Uh, I do know these were published in German first. 
and they translated it one way, and then when they published it, they changed the name. I have no idea. I I have no idea what happened here, why it was that far off, but man, that was confusing. Now, the timer was great. I have no complaints about the timer. It's themed to the game. It has artwork that matched the artwork on the box. It had some background ambiance and sound effects and noises. Um, I noticed once we got past the half hour mark, it started to sound a little more, you know, panicked and agitated. Um, plus, it works out your score at the end, which was really cool. Like, you hit done when you're done, and it asks how many clue cards, and then it gives you a nice screen that you can share on social media and stuff like that. So that part's cool. So I do recommend the app for the timer. And if you've never played an exit game before, you might want to go through one of the tutorials just to ignore what they're they're saying about background. I, I don't know. So there is I, there is an exit called uh, the Forbidden Castle, but that's the only castle I can find in the entire list of exit games. Like, well, what what are the odds of the Forbidden Castle? You're also trying to save three detectives. Like, well, I, it is finally a vacation. Uh, the short description is finally a vacation. This year, you're going to a, an idyllic village in the mountains, taking the train. Yeah, that sounds like they might have mixed up the descriptions. Okay. Because, like, this one, this is the other thing, right? In the story, it says you're with the partners, and you need a partner while playing. That was the other thing. Like, right. like that, again, goes to the two players. Well, and, that, and the Forbidden Castle talks about, mentions this sort of a group, too, but and says one to four. I wonder. Yeah. If, I wonder if that's a. Like I said I think it's a generic what they put on all their boxes. Right. I will say there was there was one riddle in here that 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 was very neat and thought outside the box. I was impressed by the like there were two that we had to work on and one one was very. I'm like wow that's that, that's cool. Like they did a good thing. I'm impressed they're able to put this many out. Like I said, the 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 key is learning how these systems work really helps. Like now that we know how exit games works, unfortunately I have one more to play here. Uh, we have the haunted roller coaster, and I'm a little worried because it's also difficulty two. So, you'll get my review of the haunted roller coaster when Deanna and I play through that one. Maybe it won't be as bad. This one, I don't know if if we were just on the ball or it's just a little too easy. But I still think great entry point for the series. I wish we played this before the secret lab. This would have made the secret lab more enjoyable because we wouldn't have had that frustration at the beginning. Well, good to know. And so, if you are looking to jump in. Um, you can check a more in-depth look at Exit the House of Riddles at tabletopbellhop.com. Just click on Review. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here, what games hit our tables. Every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and any other cool gaming stuff that's going on. So this past week, Deanna and I managed to sit down and play some games on uh, two separate occasions. She's obviously feeling better, and it's nice to not play some kids' games for a chance. Well, we're all glad to see Dee coming back around and feeling better. So, first off, we sat down the other night and broke out an exit game from Cosmos, Exit House of Riddles, which we just covered in pretty good detail in our review segment. Which, in case you missed that, I will just say, despite some odd issues with the app, it was somewhat fun but far too easy. I think if this had been our first exit game, we probably would have loved it. But compared to the Secret Lab, it was just a walk in the park and rather unrewarding. So I got to say the reward you get at the end was a nice touch. So it appears that the uh, the difficulty levels ratings ratings on these exit games are pretty accurate. So if you're looking for a tougher game, pick that higher number out of five on the, uh, the exit uh, box. Yeah, so far, I don't know if there's a one out there, but there is no way I even want to touch a one. If, if, if they, I'm, I'm hoping they start at two. Unless I'm going to play with my kids. Maybe if I if I ever find a one and I'm going to play a one, that's one where I'll grab the girls and see if they can solve it with me kind of sitting back and letting them work it. Uh, the other game we played was some Fox in the Forest. Now, we played that today as part of Renegade Game Studios Worldwide Play Day. Uh, this is a very solid two-player trick-taking game with a fairy tale theme. Now, I got to admit, going into this, two-player trick-taking just sounded like something that wasn't going to work. Like, I just don't see how that can be enjoyable. Like, trying to think of playing hearts or spades with only two people or any of the other, even diamonds or some of the more popular modern games. I just did not see it coming out. But you know what? It worked, and it worked really well. Uh, you've got 33 cards. There's three suits, number 1 to 11 in each of the suits. In general, the highest number in a suit takes a trick, but there's also a trump suit that comes up at the beginning of the game, so you can steal tricks with that. Um, you can only play off the lead suit if you have no cards, so it's uh, standard Euchre-style rules. Uh, what makes things interesting, though, 
is from number one to 11, all of the odd number cards have special abilities. And some of those are neat because they let you do things like change the trump suit, change who has the lead, swapping cards in your hand for stepping card for the cards in the draw pile and so on. So uh, compared to Goris, where you've got some of that changing the trump thing, how, how does that, you know, it, are, there, are there similarities? Is it... Uh... Um, I guess a little bit. Now, Goris, I wouldn't play two player at all. No. Just did not work out well where this did work. Uh, there is three cards in the game that let you swap out the trump, and it is the fox in each of the suits. If you play the fox, which is the three card, you can take a card in your hand and swap it for the trump. And that's where I think it's better than Goris because you're getting that card. And everyone then knows what, well, everyone, the other player knows what you picked up. Plus, they see what you put down. And when you're only dealing with 33 cards, and there are seven taken out every round, so there's definitely no perfect information. With seven out of 33 gone, it's a little hard to know, predict. But you, like, you can do the math in your head, but it's a little hard to predict exactly what's going to be gone. But if I know Deanna just picked up the nine of keys because it was Trump, I now know she has a nine of keys. Where Goris didn't have that. Goris, I found the Trump changing much more random and less intentional. It was like, oh, the guy next to me happened to play the same number as me, so I can change Trump. Right. It didn't seem as intentional. Whereas here... It was very intentional. It was like when Trump changed, there weren't very many times either of us played a fox and said, I'm just going to leave it where it is. Now, we played two times. Uh, each of us won one game each, so that was pretty fun. Uh, it was neat because they did the whole worldwide events. That was kind of cool, too. That was a nice touch. Like, that was just fun to do. That made me want to do all of these. If Renegade keeps doing these on Wednesdays, I'm going to keep trying to do it as long as I have the game available to play. Now, this game overall, what I loved about it is we've talked about this on the show. We talked about date night games. We talked about games play at pubs and coffee shops and stuff like that. And that is the kind of two-player games Deanna and I love. Small footprint, engaging, tactical, strategic games. And this definitely fits that category. This is a great game to bring out to the coffee shop, to bring out to the pub, while when we're not all stuck at home together. All right. Well, unfortunately, I haven't got much, uh, much gaming going on. Again, it's been struggling with... Uh, Trying to figure out the school schedules and get all that done <laughs> yeah. and then burned out and catch what well, catching up on YouTube when that's over because that's about as much thinking as I've uh, been willing to put <laughs> forward. Fair enough. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming week? Uh, well, I was hoping to take part in the weekly Renegade thing, but I do not have the game they're doing next week, which is, uh, I keep forgetting the name, Bargain Quest. Uh, no, it stinks. I missed last week. Last week's was Raider of the North Sea. That would have been awesome. That is one of my favorite games. That is my, by far my favorite Renegade Games game. I wish I had gotten into that one. Uh, doing the Fox in the Forest today was cool, so I'm hoping to work with Renegade some more, try to find out ahead of time what games are doing. So, Or I don't think there's any I'm going to try to get a copy by next, next Wednesday, but like ordering online right now is pointless, and I the local store would have to have it. I don't know. There's a chance. Unfortunately, Renegade, the, the local Renegade rep doesn't have a copy I can borrow this time, so... Other than that, uh, like I said, Deanna's feeling better. We're hoping to get some more games in. I'm actually even more tempted to play that exit game now just to see if it's as easy. Right. Knowing that it's going to be easy. So uh, I did it. take a look at the list. Um, uh, Pawns and Boards had a list of all the exit games. Two yeah. is the lowest number. Yeah, uh, there's a two and a half. And then uh, that, and then there's some threes and I think a four. I, I didn't see a five. So they, they don't seem to have anything that's actually listed as five. That'd be a five. Oh, there we go. Okay. That I own like a, a four five. and a half. That's a four and a half, not a oh, five. Oh, it's a four and a half. It looks like it was a five. Yep. Sorry, it's four and a okay. half. So they have a four and a half. Now, yeah. this one's a two parter where you do half of it and then you have to do another half. Right. And it has the best warning symbols I've ever seen in my entire life, which I'll throw for the chat for <laughs> a second here because there are ridiculous warning symbols. Okay. On so here. Dead Man on the Orient Express is a straight four. Uh, so sunken... that'd, be, that'd be more difficult than Secret Lab. So, sunken Treasure is a two. Sinister Mansion is a three. Uh, as uh, the secret lab is three and a half, uh, Polar Station is three, Pharaoh's Tomb is four, Mysterious Museum is two, House of Riddles is two, uh, Haunted Roller Coaster is two, yeah, Forgotten Island is three, Forbidden Castle is four, Catacombs mm. of Horror is four and a half, uh, and Abandoned Cabin is the two and a half. And that's I've uh, seen that one strongly recommended as a starter one. Yeah. So again, the two the two seem to be they, they should be the ones. Yeah. Sounds like the one I compare these two, maybe I'll find out that one's like a point five and the other's a two. Uh, the other thing happening is on Friday, uh, I'm gonna have some YouTube content coming out on our channel. 
uh, a review and a uh, quick over overview of a digital board game that's not actually a board game, but might as well be. So <laughs> we'll get to that. When do you think we'll have the Fox in the Forest AP up? Next Thursday or tomorrow? Uh, probably not tomorrow, although we'll see. Uh, no, you know what? I've got like two different conference calls tomorrow okay. morning. So, so I'll have Thursday, our so Yeah, next Thursday. People who are curious about Fox in the Forest, we are going to put up the actual play. Uh, Deanna and I play two games. You'll get to hear the the global effects. I know Tech, who's in our chat room right now, said he needed to pick up a copy after seeing us play it. So there were a couple other people with some pretty positive comments about the game, just seeing us play it. So right. we'll get that up. We haven't had an actual play in a while. So Indeed. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests. Our Patreon backers, we greatly appreciate their support. William Fisher, thank you. Danielle Thomas, thanks, Danielle. Sean P. Kelly. Thank you, Sean. One of these days, I'll remember to join you again on Monday. I always forget. Yeah. Andrew Dacey. Thank you. And Diane Tuzano. Thanks, Ma. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end. We're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you dig the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping your bellhop through our new and improved Patreon at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here every on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers on YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. And be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And game on. Game on. on.